Hello, everyone. My name is Julie Huss. I'm a member of the program committee for CNS. I'd like to welcome you back to our next oral sessions. Uh, we have one featured and one oral presentation uh, today. Um, uh, just a reminder, all of these sessions are recorded, so you can always go back to any given link through the Crowdcast link and replay it as you'd like. Um, I'd like to point out at the bottom of the screen, there is an ask a question function. Please feel free to use that to ask questions and to vote on the questions that um, that will be answered at the end of the um, session. Sorry about the echo. I'll mute myself in just a second. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to pre present our first speaker, Giannis Posokas, who will tell us about head direction in two different in insect species. Um, he'll give a 30-minute presentation and then 10 minutes for questions. Uh, without further ado, here's Giannis. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for attending my talk. Um, can you see my slides? Yes? Okay. Um, thank you for attending my talk. Most of you will be familiar with the head direction cells of rodents. If you place your electrodes in a specific areas of the brain of a rat, you can see that particular cells are firing when the rat is facing towards a specific direction in respect to its visual surroundings. As the animal turns around, different cells become active. Each cell is tuned to a different heading and it becomes active when the animal is facing towards that direction. A common hypothesis is that these cells are part of a ring attractor. A ring attractor is a ring of neurons connected in such a way so that only a localized group of neurons is maximally active at any moment in time and all other neurons are silenced. This results in a localized bump of activity that can be maintained even without providing an external stimulus to the circuit. Insects also have neurons encoding the animal's head direction. I'm going to be talking about these insect neurons today. This is a picture of the brain of an insect, the Drosophila fruit fly. The colored portion is known as the central complex. It has been established that the central complex is necessary for an insect to maintain its orientation. In this talk, I'm going to be concerned with only two of these colored structures. The dark blue mustache-shaped structure, which is called the protocerebral bridge, and the orange donut-shaped structure, which is known as the ellipsoid body. Now let's have a look at the donut-shaped structure, the ellipsoid body of a fruit fly. If you place a fruit fly in a virtual reality environment and you look at its ellipsoid body, you can see a peak of calcium concentration that moves around the ellipsoid body as the insect rotates in respect to its visual surroundings. At the bottom right, the blue line shows you the actual heading of the fruit fly, and the red line shows the heading decoded by looking at the calcium concentration around the ellipsoid body. If you turn off the visual stimuli, the calcium bump remains in place, suggesting a ring attractor-like operation. The advantage of working with insects is that these days we have neuron level anatomical detail of whole brain areas. If we look closer at the neural anatomy of the central complex of different insect species, we see several anatomical differences. Here we compare two species. The Drosophila fruit fly on the left and the desert locust on the right. We chose those two species because they are 400 million years apart in evolution, and it is therefore interesting to see how their homologous circuits compare. There are three main anatomical differences between those two species. First, the ellipsoid body in fruit flies has a ring shape, while in locusts is a linear shape. Second, the protocerebral bridge in the fruit fly consists of 18 segments, the one next to the other, and 18 corresponding columns of neurons that interconnect the protocerebral bridge with the ellipsoid body. In contrast, in the locust, the protocerebral bridge has 16 segments and corresponding groups of vertical neurons. Third, the delta-7 neurons that run along the length of the protocerebral bridge 
different linear polarization pattern. Here at the bottom, I'm showing two of these neurons. In the fruit fly, they have dendritic terminals all along their length, while in locusts, they only have dendrites in specific portions along their neuri, with gaps in between. We saw the anatomical differences between the two species. Now the question is, how do the underlying circuits compare to each other? One approach for comparing two brain systems is to extract from the neural imaging data the connectivity matrices and simulate them. You can provide the same stimulus to both of them and compare their responses. This approach will allow you to compare their function but will not provide you with a real mechanistic understanding of their inner structure. Another approach is to instead reverse engineer the underlying circuit structure. Then you will be able to compare both their function and the actual circuits to see how their implementation differs. This second approach is important from an ethological point of view because it can reveal circuit features that evolved for supporting the different lifestyles of individual species. Here we are going to reverse engineer the underlying circuits and then compare their structure and their function. But first, I will take a historical diversion to give some methodological context on why and what we're doing here. Back in the Cold War era, competing powers would get access to the latest hardware from the other side of the Iron Curtain. They would cut the microchip cell open and they would etch off layer after layer of the microchip silicon, taking photographs of this layer, and then they would try to reconstruct the three-dimensional silicon structure. Everyone knew that this was happening, so designers sometimes were trying to confuse the people on the other side, while other times they would leave hidden messages to help them. However, having the three-dimensional structure was not enough. So engineers would systematically try to reverse engineer the circuit in order to get a symbolic representation they can understand and replicate. In our times, we are slicing brains and we are imaging layer after layer, trying to reconstruct the three-dimensional structure of neurons. The resolution we have is impressive, but to understand what is really going on, we need to extract the underlying circuit. Microchips are man-made systems with particular structure. Engineers trying to understand them knew what circuitry modules they were expecting to find. This is not the case with brains. Evolutionary processes do not optimize for structural simplicity and don't leave hidden messages to help us. This is a more challenging task. We need to, help, we need to learn from the past and develop repeatable methods. What we learned from the past is that having the three-dimensional structure of the substrate does not give us adequate understanding of the inner workings. We need an abstracted symbolic representation of the neural circuit to understand its principles of implementation and operation. We return now to our question. What is the underlying circuit and how it differs between the two species? In the next few slides, I'm going to walk you through the process of extracting the underlying circuits from the traced neurons. First, let's look at the inhibitory part of the circuit. The inhibitory neurons run along the length of protocerebral bridge. These are the delta-7 neurons I mentioned earlier. This is the schematic of the protocerebral bridge of a fruit fly organized in 18 segments where neurons form synapses. There are eight inhibitory neurons that run along its length. Here I have drawn them the one under the other so that they are visible. These insect neurons are different than the typical vertebrate neurons you might be familiar with. Each neuron has output terminals in two or three segments and the dendritic terminals in all other segments. All eight neurons have the same pattern of synaptic terminals shifted by one column in respect to the others. In each segment, only one neuron has output terminals and makes synapses with the other seven neurons that have input terminals in the same segment. If we look at this first segment, we can redraw the synaptic connections as a graph, with each neuron represented as a circle and lines representing synapses. 
as we can see, this neuron inhibits all other seven neurons. We can do the same for the second segment, the next segment, and add this synaptic connection to the graph. We can repeat this for all eight neurons to get the whole circuit. It is clear now that in the fruit fly, the circuit has an underlying global inhibition pattern. Its neuron inhibits all others. Now we can do the same for the locust. In the locust, there are again eight inhibitory neurons that run along the length of the protocerebral bridge. Here again, all neurons have the same pattern of synaptic terminals, shifted by one column in respect to the others. However, in its segment, only three neurons have dendritic terminals and therefore receive input. If we redraw the synap synaptic connections of the first segment as a graph, we get this pattern now. We see that the first neuron inhibits only some of the other neurons. We can do the same for the second segment, and we can repeat this for all eight neurons to get the whole circuit. We see that in the locus, the circuit has a local inhibition pattern. Its neuron inhibits only some of the other neurons. That was the easy part. Now let's look into the excitatory part of the circuit. The excitatory part consists of three types of columnar neurons interconnecting the protocerebral bridge with the ellipsoid body. We have more neurons now, and our problem is how to systematically follow their connectivity around the whole circuit. The trick is in the labeling of the protocerebral bridge segments. I've numbered the segments of the protocerebral bridge from one to nine, from left to right in both hemispheres. In this way, Neurons innervating equally numbered segments of the protocerebral bridge have the same neural activity. That allows us to collapse pairs of neurons into one single equivalent neural connection, removing redundancy and simplifying the resulting circuit. We can do this for the first type of neurons, these EPG neurons, because they connect equally numbered segments of the protocerebral bridge to a single slice of the ellipsoid body. We can redraw this as a graph by arranging the three types of neurons in three concentric cycles and connecting them with arrows to represent synapses. The second type of neurons, the PN neurons, connect its protocerebral bridge segment to a slice shift to the left or to the right. We can also add these connections to our graph. Finally, the third type of neurons, the PG neurons, connect again equally numbered segments of the protocerebral bridge to single slices of the ellipsoid body. We can also collapse these pairs of neurons into one equivalent neural connection in the graph. This is the connectivity pattern we get for the first set of neurons. We can do the same for the next set of neurons and we get again the same pattern. If we keep following the neurons all around the protocerebral bridge and the ellipsoid body, we get this effective circuit. We observe that the effective circuit has, of the fruit fly has an eight-fold radial symmetry. Next, let's do the same for the locust. Here, the protocerebral bridge has eight segments in its hemisphere, and the ellipsoid body is not a circle anymore. It's a linear structure organized in columns. There are again three types of neurons. The EPG neurons now follow this pattern, with its pair innervating two neighboring columns of the ellipsoid body. This is their connectivity if we redraw them as a graph. The PN neurons innervate two neighboring columns in the ellipsoid body without a gap between them now. And the PG neurons follow this pattern that, and this is the connectivity we get for the first set of neurons. We can do the same for the rest of the neurons around the circuit until we get at this point. What is not obvious here is whether the ring would close between the branches one and eight. In the fruit fly, the ellipsoid body had a circular shape, which was a telltale sign that the circuit must be a ring, and it was. In the locust, the ellipsoid body is a linear structure. Its two ends are separated. It is therefore not clear if the underlying circuit is a ring or not. It turns out that an anatomical peculiarity that exists in the locust, but not in the fruit fly, 
is important for the result. Unlike all other EPG neurons that have terminals narrowly confined in single segments of the protocellular bridge, the, ellipsoid, the, sorry, the EPG neurons that innervate the middle portion of the protocellular bridge are actually not confined in single segments, but also innervate one of the neighboring segments in the other hemisphere. If we add these connections to our graph, we realize that these peculiar middle neurons actually close the ring. It becomes apparent from this graph representation that the locust circuit also has an eightfold radial structure. If we place the effective circuits of the two species side by side, we observe that they have a similar structure. Regardless of the anatomical differences, the essential structure of the circuit has been preserved. I should mention that at the top of the is the inhibitory part and at the bottom is the excitatory part of the circuits. They are connected, but I have drawn them separately here for simplicity. There are three differences between the two circuits. The fruit fly has a global inhibition pattern while the locust has a local inhibition pattern. As we saw, both circuits form closed rings but using two very different solutions. The one is anatomically erect, while the other has neurons that innervate specific neighboring segments in order to, to close the ring. The third difference is that the locust circuit has an extra reciprocal connection between the green and the yellow neurons. These reciprocal connections do not exist in the fruit fly. We also observe the presence of the red neurons. These neurons form local feedback loops around the ring in both species. At this point, we have derived the underlying structure of the circuit at the single neuron level. Now we want to study its function. By using simulations, we found that with appropriate selection of the synaptic weights, both circuits can function as ring attractors. Neural activity will form a bump around the ring and will be maintained there even without stimulus. The question now is, what is the functional effect of this difference between the circuits we found in the two species? First, we will investigate how fast its ring attractor circuit can update its heading when the animal turns. This will inform us about the fastest animal rotation that its circuit can track. This is the experimental setup. We simulate an insect turning in respect to its visual surroundings, and we are looking in the response dynamics of the ring attractor circuit. We want to see how the circuit responds to changes of the animal's heading. There are two types of information insects might use to update the ring attractor. The first one is visual cues that are mapped retinotopically around the ring. If, for example, the fruit fly faces in one direction, neurons in this branch of the ring will be stimulated, moving the activity bump there. If the fly turns in respect to its visual surroundings, neurons at another branch will be stimulated, moving the activity bump to that location. Another situation is when the insect moves in darkness. When the fruit fly moves in darkness, it cannot see the visual cues, but it can still use angular velocity information to update its ring attractor heading. In what follows, I'm going to be talking about the first type of stimulus, when the animal can actually see its surroundings. If we plot the location of the activity bump around the ring attractor as angular heading, we, can, we get this kind of picture. On the horizontal axis is time, and the vertical axis is the heading of the activity bump around the ring attractor. The ring attractor starts with the activity bump at an initial heading, and then a time t 
we provide a stimulus and a new heading, as if the animal suddenly turned. We want to measure how long it takes for the activity bump to move to this new heading. This measurement will tell us how fast the circuit can track rotations of the animal. We run simulations using spiking network models of the Turing attractors. This plot shows that the fruit fly circuit takes significantly less time to transition between, between headings. Therefore, the fruit fly circuit can track faster changes of the animal's head. This is shown here for different amounts of angular change. It turns out that the difference in transition time is due to the inhibition pattern, global versus local. Remember that the difference in the inhibition pattern is due to the distribution of the dendritic terminals along the inhibitory neurons. This difference in response time is ecologically relevant because fruit flies are known to perform very fast body turns, while locusts are not. A faster response of the ring attractor circuit allows it to keep track of faster turns of the animal. Another aspect of a ring attractor is its stability characteristics. We want, we want to see how well its circuit can maintain its heading. The stability criterion we, we use is that for a ring attractor heading to be considered stable, it should remain within boundaries for a certain amount of time. When the synaptic weights are properly tuned, both the fruit fly and the locust ring attractors can maintain a stable heading. But if the synaptic weights deviate from their tuned values, we see that their stability deteriorates. With the locust model being more tolerant to such variations of synaptic weights than the fruit fly model. So the locust model is more tolerant to this kind of fluctuations. The locust model is also more tolerant to variations in the membrane properties of the neurons, as we can see here. It turns out that the increased tolerance of the locus to variations of synaptic weights and membrane properties is due to the extra connections between the PN and the EPG neurons. These are the green and the yellow neurons. As I mentioned earlier, these reciprocal connections exist only in the locus and they are the result of a difference in the projection pattern of the PN neurons between the two species, as you see here. This difference is again ecologically relevant because locusts are a migratory species. And if you want to travel over long distances, it is advantageous to be able to maintain a stable heading. Now we're going to look into the effect of the PEG neurons, the red ones. These neurons exist in both species and form local feedback loops around the rings. If we remove these neurons, then both models become more sensitive to synaptic weight tuning. Therefore, these neurons improve the stability of the ring attractor in both species by operating as local feedback loops. As you can see here for the fruit fly and the locust. Until this point, we examined the circuit function when stimulated with artificial sudden changes of heading. Now we're going to see the performance of the two circuits when tracking the heading of a real fruit fly during its flight. This is the recording of a real fruit fly flying in a cylindrical, cylindrical environment. In these plots, the gray lines show the actual animal heading and the colored lines the heading encoded by the two ring attractors. During fast turns, both ring attractors lag behind the actual heading, but they catch up as soon as the animal slows down. It's not easy to see the difference in performance between the two ring attractors from these plots, though, so I have plotted here their difference. The red area is, is, is the difference between the headings of the two circuits. Both circuits receive the same stimulus, but the locust, which is slower, lags further behind. 
especially when the animal performs fast turns. But then it is able to catch up during the slower portions of the flight because the available visual stimulus keeps updating the ring attractor to the correct heading. But what happens if the lights are turned off? If we, if we instead turn off the visual stimuli, as if the animal moves in darkness, then it can only use angular velocity to update the ring attractor. This is, this is the second type of stimulus I talked about earlier. In this case, the ring attractor does not receive visual input that would allow it to correct its heading during the slow portions of the flight. Instead, the activity bump location the, instead the activity bump location is updated by integrating angular velocity and therefore it accumulates error over time since the locust circuit lags further behind it accumulates more heading error so the response speed of the ring attractor is even more important when the animal moves in darkness in conclusion we saw that the core structure of the head direction circuit has been conserved over a long period of evolution while acquiring adaptations that accommodate the particular ecological needs of each species. We also saw that even seemingly small anatomical differences have a significant effect on the ability of the two circuits to track fast rotational motion and maintain a stable heading. Analyzing the underlying circuits allowed us to identify the circuit elements that are responsible for these differences. Our findings highlight the importance of a comparative approach in neuroscience that can allow us to understand the significance of evolutionary adaptations and to derive the principles of the neural implementation of brains. Studying the principles of the neural implementation of brain circuits can guide the development of new theoretical models and can even help us in building better artificial agents such as robots. If you're interested, you can find more details in our paper, which was published this month. Thank you very much for your attention. I would like to thank my PhD advisors, Barbara Webb and Stanley Haynes, and my funders for supporting this research. I look forward to answering your questions. I'll be your single applauser. Thank you, Yanni. Thank you. Uh, so we do have a few questions. I will, um, I will unfocus your talk if that's okay, and invite um, our askers on screen so they can ask their questions. And first, we'll get. Thomas Navani. Um, can you see his question, Yanni? Uh, just a moment. Okay, please. There we go. I'm trying to move my mouse. Okay, yes. All right. Am I, am I on? Yeah. All right. Um, okay. I have you a quick question about the difference between the circuits. I mean, you explained to us how uh, this overlap region in the middle of the protocerebral bridge would help mm -hmm. the low to close the circle on, on its ring attractor. But mm -hmm. noticeably, there was a difference in connectivity at that edge point. Does it make a difference? You mean there was a difference in connectivity? The resulting what? ring had a... Yeah. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Connectivity, yes. right? Yes. Right. Very good, uh, yes. Uh, if you adjust the synaptic weights, the synaptic weights properly, the bump moves through, so you can make it equivalent. Yes, it's a bit weird, but essentially the activity goes. Can you see my mouse there? I cannot see my mouse anymore. Okay, no, yeah. I can't. Essentially, understand. essentially, you can do it so it is uh, working equivalently. Just it goes to another neuron instead of going directly from the one to the other. So yeah, it was not obvious in the beginning. The beginning. Okay, thank you. Very good question, though. Yeah, very good. Uh, thanks. Um, so we have another, I should have marked that answered. Um, we have another question from Wouter Kiln. I'm sure I have slayed his name. Walter Klein. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs> so 
So we've invited him on screen. I can't. Oh, I probably need to kill Thomas. Hello, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. Good evening. It's a very simple question. Um, you showed a lot of very interesting and fascinating uh, patterns and tableaus of connectivities. Are these for single neurons or are there is there redundancies or is this for groups of neurons? These are single neurons. Single neurons? Yes. For every neuron I saw you, there are between two and four, depending on the type of neuron. But yeah, it's single neurons. Yes. So, so if if one of the neurons were to die, that direction cannot be tracked anymore. Okay, there are between two and four neurons of each of one of the ones I saw you. So, yeah, if one dies, I guess the circuit will continue working, but you know, it will not be the probably the synaptic. Uh, Strength would be a little bit different there. Okay, thank you. That was the question. There is a redundancy, yes. So it's, yeah, good point. All right. Our next question um, is from Dory. I will invite her on screen. Hello. Hello. Um, thanks very much for your talk. That was really interesting. I was just wondering, kind of related to the last question um, about sort of the number of neurons, does this have any effect of, on the sort of um, resolution, the radio resolution with, with which they can sort of detect their direction? Yes. Um, if you consider okay, if you don't have stim or if you if you have stimulus, then you can push the bump anywhere you want, right? So it's, you can consider it as a population code, so the bump can be continuously anywhere around the ring. Mm -hmm. If you remove stimulus, so darkness, then the bump tends to end in one of the balancing points. So it will be one of the branches, or exactly in between, most likely one of the eight branches. So you have a resolution of forty-five degrees there. Um, now. Interestingly enough, what you ask is related to something else. From recent data that came uh, um, after we submitted this paper uh, the last few months, what happens is that from EM data, electron microscopy data, we see that there are interconnections even between the ellipsoid body, between neurons. If these are used, then you would potentially, we don't know, but you might be able to actually increase the resolution. Instead of having one-to-one -one connection, you might have little connections in between. So you might be able to have higher resolution, but we haven't looked into that. I don't really know. Okay, cool. Yeah, Thanks. the other thing, if you have an insect, and if you see if it, if you can push it to go in a specific direction, and if, you know, if it will return back to whatever is one of the eight directions, mm. that would be the thing. Yeah. But the things are so noisy, you know, behavior is so noisy that I, I guess it would be difficult really to see that. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you, Dory. And I think we have a final question from Martin. I can see if I have personal messages in the chat. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> says, I don't know. Yeah, I can answer it. Can Hi, you can. I do anyway. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, good. So, did I understand correctly that uh, this ring attractor circuit also gets uh, input uh, on the angular velocity, which uh, then helps to maintain the heading in darkness? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And so then, then my question is, uh, uh, as you know, in the fly, there is uh, the hull tier, uh, the hull tier mm -hmm. circuit, which gives very good information on the angular velocity during these fast yaw saccades, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where, which is where you saw the most difference between 
the locust and the fly in your modeling. So, uh, and uh, I was wondering, is it known if this uh, ring circuit receives actually uh, input from the hull tier circuit? Uh, so if it actually gets more precise information on the angular velocity than in the case of the locust? As far from the details I'm aware of, uh, there have been several attempts to see where they get the angular velocity from. Um, well, certainly it is, certainly the, the, the central complex gets various information from various modalities, right? Now, whether healthiers are the ones providing the angular velocity, I cannot, I'm not really, I don't remember really. Probably it would not be the only input, but but it would be a very. Yeah, I think I, think I heard something. Yeah. Yeah. It must be right because it's a yeah important sensory modality. I'm sure I read something about it, but I don't remember really. So yeah, I, you know. yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm familiar with this local heart tier circuit, how it influences the wing motion, mm -hmm. but I not not how it influences the. Yeah, there was a paper where they were trying to cut them off and see what happens. I think mm -hmm. you know. To eliminate where where the source comes, but I don't remember what was the. Yeah, I should look it up again. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Martin. Yanni, I do have one more question for you, if you don't mm -hmm. mind. Um, tell when you varied synaptic strength in the model, and you and you looked at robustness to changes in that. Which synapses were you changing? Can you tell me about that? Ah, there were two experiments there. The one was we, I was changing the synaptic strength randomly, so all synapses in all the network. All the excitatory or inhibitory you know, or which? Yeah. And there is another experiment where we change, we try to see how much imbalance it takes. So if you damage half of the brain, how tolerant it is, right, for increasing amount of change in half, one hemisphere essentially, when it breaks. So there are two types of you know, synaptic changes there. Okay. It was the first graph, I think, yeah, the first graph I saw you was the random change of all synapses. The second graph was the trying to change one hemisphere only. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for your contributed talk at this point. Um, <laughs> I think um, at this point I will... Um, if there are no more questions for Yanni, I will um, close you out and we'll get going with Alicia. It might give me a, give me a second to um, bring her onto screen. So thanks again, Yanni. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, I have invited Alicia. Hi. Hello. Welcome. I think we're just a minute or two early, but if you'd like to get started, if you can share your screen so I can ensure that that works great. Sure. That, um, does it work? Everything OK? <laughs> yeah, that looks fantastic. Um, all right, everyone, I'll, I think I'll turn it over at this point to Alicia Garia Pena, who will tell us about uh, variability in the Lamnea feeding circuit, rhythmic circuit. All right. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah, so uh, thank you everybody for attending this session. I'm Alicia Garia Pena, a PhD student in Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. And yes, I'm going to talk to you about the, our experimental and computational study in the characterization of interoperability in the sequential activity of the linear CP, feeding CPG. So first I'm going to do a brief introduction into central pattern generators, uh, CPGs, and the concept of dynamical invariance, which I've been recently found in these circuits. And then I'll describe the feeding CPG in Limnea and the exper our experimental and computational approach for studying uh, the variability in, in its sequences. So central pattern generators are neural circuits generating uh, robust, robust sequences of neural activity. And this neural activity generates and control uh, motor rhythms in an autonomous manner. So these uh, circuits are present in many systems from vertebrates to invertebrates. And these last ones are usually used to, to study them 
uh, since they are usually uh, simple and also more accessible. Uh, so some example of the motor reading they generate can be found in uh, heart beating or in some walking patterns. And uh, the reading they, they generate is, they, they are flexible enough to adapt the, the reading to changes in their context. So the central pattern generators we are going to study here are non-open topologies, uh, which means that all the neurons in the circuit are connected to at least one other neuron, uh, as you can see in this diagram on the right. And the reading they generate is based on, on mutual inhibition. As you can see in this video, the, the three neurons here present in these three colors alternate their, their bursting activity, uh, inhibiting each other. So the temporal sequences that are um, generated here um, are maintained cycle by cycle. So in one of these circuits, uh, specifically in the pylotic CPE, uh, in, in carcinus magnum, um, there have been recently found a dynamical invariance uh, by Elises in 2019, Elises and colleagues. Uh, and this concept of dynamical invariance are specific intervals building the sequence that are highly correlated um, cycle by cycle. Here you can see in this video how um, during the sequences, these two intervals are highly correlated to this uh, period uh, here. Um, and in this experimental study, uh, they show how uh, this phenomena is consistent even under high variability in these situations with we, we ethanol. Uh, so another example of a feeding CPG is the linea uh, in the linea stagnalis, which is a pond snail, which you can see here. And in this CPG, a uh, three-phasic reading is generated um, with uh, three neurons associated to each phase. First, the mouth opens, uh, the lips. Uh, the radula catch the food, and then the, in the swallow, the the food is, the food is uh, pushed through the esophagus. So they are associated to these three main neurons: in one, in two, p, and in in three t. Uh, so we are going to uh, study the presence of dynamical invariance in. I mean, we are going to see here the study of the presence of dynamical invariance in this feeding CPE. Uh, not only in an experimental uh, study, but also with a computational approach. So for the um, experimental approach, we uh, follow electrophysiology techniques, specifically intracellular recording techniques in the buccal ganglia that you can see here, where uh, motor neurons and interneurons in the system are here distributed. Uh, you can appreciate them here. And interneurons are the ones generating the, the reading in the CPG. Uh, motor neurons are the ones following the CPG activity and generating the actual move in the, in the motor movement. So uh, there are some other important neurons uh, related to the CPG, which has a modulatory role, as it can be this SO, which can be found in, the, in this diagram of, uh, of, the, of the buccal ganglia and also some neurons in the, in the cerebral ganglia. So in the limnea literature, there is a study by Elliot and Andrew where they study the temporal variability uh, cycle by cycle. And here we have uh, some of the results uh, with the spontaneous feeding activity where they represent the duration of each phase, which uh, for them is uh, like the interval of, the, of each bar's duration representing these three neurons. And we can appreciate how, uh, in the correlation with the with the pe with the period, uh, it's uh, there's a high correlation when the uh, for the N3 uh, case. In this study, they also show how uh, it is possible to induce feeding rhythm uh, by simulating in one M neuron and SO. So for our experimental approach, we uh, we are trying to reproduce this um, this. Uh, these results uh, uh, doing a wider study. And for that purpose, we've uh, taken these two uh, intracellular recordings of two motor neurons, uh, which we have here in two colors. And for one of the neurons, we've differentiated uh, between two, 
two different uh, frequencies of spiking. Uh, here is a faster spiking and here is, is a slower spiking in order to have the three main phases uh, of the CPE activity. So for studying these sequences, uh, we've uh, defined the same temporal events that the, were defined in the pyloric CPG study. Our uh, references, uh, uh, reference events are the first and last spike of each parse. And in combination of uh, these two ev events, we can define different intervals. On the one hand, here we have the bar duration intervals, uh, shown for three different examples in neurons. And it goes from the first spike in a bar to the last spike in, in that same bar. And on the other hand, we have the period, which goes from the first spike uh, in one bar to the next first spike in the same neuron. Um, when combining these uh, temporal references with uh, between two neurons, we can define some derived intervals. As uh, here, for example, from the N2 to the uh, so from the N2 and first uh, to the N2 we can define uh, derived intervals uh, from the first spike of the N1 to the first spike to the N2. In the same line, we can define the delays, derived intervals, that go from the last spike in a burst uh, from one neuron to the first spike of a burst in another neuron. So making all possible combinations, we, we obtain all these intervals. And it is interesting to study all these intervals and not only some, for example, the bar duration, since uh, these intervals give us uh, wider information about the, the sequences uh, during cycle by cycle. Uh, for example, here you can see N3 and 2 interval uh, covers not only the N3 uh, bar duration, but also uh, N1 bar duration. So with uh, analyzing all these intervals, we've, uh, we can see here in this box plot the variability distribution of all of them. Uh, here in orange, we have the, the period. And, and then we can see here how there are some intervals that present uh, high variability. Uh, and they are all related to the M3 bars duration. Uh, as you can see, if you remember here, the N3 and 2 interval, which covered uh, N1 and N2, is one of the most variable ones. And they all have a similar distribution uh, between each other. And yeah, when, when, observe, when we observe the correlation of each one of them uh, represented in the y-axis uh, against the period uh, for each one or each case, we can see how there are some intervals that are highly correlated to, to the period. And we can appreciate that in also in the R square value, uh, which all of uh, the most valuable ones uh, are the ones presenting a higher value uh, here. And it is important to notice how there are some, some, of, the, some of the intervals that they don't, uh, they have no relation with the period. So, this, uh, this means that the variability in these sequences, uh, cycle by, shown here cycle by cycle, uh, are constrained in this dynamical invariance uh, that we can see. So for the computational approach, uh, we've used conductance-based models, what's in Hashley type, since they reproduce uh, precise waveforms and synapses. Uh, so the, the biggest difficulty we find uh, when working with these conductance-based models is that they don't usually have enough variability to study the dynamical invariance. Uh, we've used here the definition of the feeding CPE model by Baboulis, uh, Baboulis in college uh, in 2007, uh, where they define the main three neurons in the CPE uh, that we have already seen, uh, as well as a fourth neuron, which has a modulatory role. So here you can appreciate how the um, like the characteristic uh, waveforms for each one of the neurons, and this is possible thanks to this def their definition uh, with two compartments where they are differentiating between the slow dynamics in the soma and the fast dynamic in the axon, where the spiking uh, like the spiking activity, for example, can be modulated. 
So here in this summer, we can find that there are uh, three ionic channels uh, that are related to each one of the, of the three neurons here. And this uh, specific ionic channel generate this concrete and characteristic uh, waveform for each one of the neurons. In the case of N1M, it provides it uh, with this slow depolarization activity, as well as the plateau burst effect at the end of the burst. Uh, for the N2V neuron, we can see the uh, low amplitude spikes uh, that are generated thanks to its ionic channel. And, and uh, finally, for the N3T neuron, we have this uh, post inhibitory rebound, uh, also thanks to the to this cha its a specific channel. So, in combination of these specific waveforms and the gradual synapse, they have that is affected from uh, by the the um, uh, presynaptic neuron voltage, uh, we have these nice uh, circuits. Uh, so even though this uh, model does not have uh, intrinsic, does not produce like intrinsic variability, it is possible to induce it by changing the injected current to each neuron. So we define a ramp simulation protocol where uh, we, we increase gradually the, the, the injected current to one of the neurons. Uh, here in this example, you can see uh, the effect on the, when applying this current to N3T. So we've done these simulations, uh, injected current in N1M, SO, and N3. N1M and SO, since uh, following the results of um, Elliot and Andrew, and also in this uh, same uh, paper of uh, Baboulis. So if any one of you is interested in using this code, it's available in our GitHub, uh, GMB, um, so uh, CPG, Feeding, Linnea. Uh, the link is available in my profile in Sket. And uh, feel free to use it and ask us and contact us if you have any questions. So for these simulations, we've uh, analyzed the same intervals. And we have... Um, uh, we have here a, uh, a view, a preview of how how does this uh, effect, like how the circuit uh, evolves uh, uh, and its sequences. And um, we have an example of three of the intervals here, and um, how they um, maintain their correlation with the period, uh, even under the changes in the, in the variability sequence, like cycle by cycle. Uh, so when we observe the, the, the variability distribution for these two simulations, when the current is injected to N1 and the current injected to N3, we see that the distribution is, uh, variability distribution for each interval is pretty similar. Uh, and once again, we have uh, all the, the most variable ones are the ones related to N3 and uh, other um, intervals that cover this this activity. And when the, however, when we observe the the case uh, when it's simulating the SO, uh, we can see in comparison to the case when we were uh, simulating in one that the, the distribution has changed. And now we have more intervals presenting high variability and including the N1 bar duration uh, and some derived intervals. So here we have the, the correlation uh, with the period for each one of the intervals in the cases of N1. And uh, here we can appreciate how how there are some dynamical invariants as we see we saw before. And uh, now, when the when the current ramp is injected into SO, it's interesting to notice that the, there are now more dynamical invariants. Uh, this means that now the variability is not only constrained by uh, these intervals, uh, but also about this uh, bars duration in N1 and the, the derived uh, intervals. So, um, yeah, uh, during this talk, uh, in conclusion, we've seen that dynamical invariants are uh, rules to coordinate intervals in robust sequential neural activity. 
and they are present in experimental studies as well as in computational studies where when variability is induced by stimulation. Uh, apart from that, they have been found in two systems, uh, here in the Limnea stagnalis and also in the Carcinus, uh, in the pyloric CPG. Um, we have uh, some different results and some different dynamical invariants depending on the neurons simulated, which can be a result of the adaptation of the reading and the sequences to, to the context. So these results point out to the universality of, of this phenomena uh, in robust neural sequences. Uh, so thank you. I wanted to uh, thank my my, uh, my research group, uh, GMB, and also especially the people involved in this project, Irene Elise, Rafael Levy, uh, my pastor Pablo Valona, uh, Francisco Eboja, and also uh, Manuel Reyes and Rodrigo Maducci for their help with these nice videos. So thank you all. Thank you, Alicia. For a, for a wonderful talk and uh, congratulations on some great work. Thank you. Um, I will now close out your screen and that brings just to two of us and I will invite some questions on screen first from Astrid. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. I can, Astrid. Okay, yeah, uh, my question is, is very simple. I was looking at the experimental data on slides, I think it was 12 and 13, and I was wondering, are they just from one animal, or is this uh, including data from multiple animals? Uh, it's just from, thank you for your question, it's only for one same animal uh, from uh, the intracellular recordings. So, but they, they are the all the intervals uh, that can be defined in those recordings from the CPG activity. Okay, and uh, since I have the floor right now, can I ask a, a, another question that I didn't uh, type in? Um, am I understanding this correctly? If you uh, took your model and you were not to inject any stimulation current, but you would just let it run there would basically be zero variability. It would be a, a rock solid period that would repeat over and over without any variability. Yes, and in, that's in, right. in contrast, when you look at the experimental data, if you just record from the CPG, from the experimental CPG, and also don't inject anything, you will get variability and each period will be slightly different. So I'm wondering if, um, the, what you call variability that you get in the model by injecting currents, whether that's really the same kind of variability that you see in the experimental preparation, right? Because you're, you're basically forcing the period to change by injecting current, whereas in the, in the experimental preparation, it, it will automatically have some amount of variability. So have yes. you thought about what, what are, what are, potential differences and all, especially of course in terms of mechanism yeah uh, the point with this model is that the when you are when you induce uh, like when you inject current uh, for example in n1 uh, the n1 bar duration is not the one changing but it has the the capacity to adapt to to the changes in one other neuron so it's a phenomenon of the all com the, the combination of the synapses connection the variability we induced and the and the the waveforms uh, also we for that purpose we uh, did this uh, ramp stimulation and we leave uh, some time for the neuron to to adapt uh, and the circuit to adapt to, to this new new value so it's not an effect that we produce like changing the, the RAM. Um, yeah. And also in the experimental recordings in the study by Elliot uh, and Andrew, they show some similar results when they were simula actually stimulating the, these two neurons. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Astrid. I think I'll bring up Patricia who has a similar question about the 
noise induced by the ramp current. So hopefully he'll be here in a second. Right. Yes. Here. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank. You. Maybe my question is very highly related to the last question of Astrid, because uh, I think it appears that your simulations are highly uh, other deterministic. You're not introducing any noise into any stochasticity. So maybe the answer for Astrid's question maybe introduce either a noisy current or uh, simulating ion channel stochasticity. Have you thought about that? Uh, yeah, we've tried to add some noise to the, um, in other models uh, in order to induce variability to study these dynamical invariants, but usually the variability they produce is not enough to, to see this effect. Uh, so it would be interesting to, to see it with noise, uh, these same simulations, but the activity should remain uh, based on this current injection. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe, maybe with channel knowledge you will get a, a, another diff. Uh, yeah, we can it's, talk later. It's a good we'll one. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Patricia. Um, our next question will invite uh, Diego Becerra on screen. It's a question about Linnaeus feeding circuits. I don't seem to be able to invite Diego. Just close. Diego would like to know if there's only one CPG control feeding in the in Linnea. Uh, yes, um, there are more CPGs in the Linnea system, but for this feeding, uh, there's one uh, CPG. Many neurons involved, since this is a distributed system, but uh, the CPG itself is just one. Just one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And mm -hmm. our last question will invite Thomas back. He wants to know about staircases. Okay, hi. Here you go. Hi. I have a question. Um, I noticed in your in your plots from the model, and you plotted the duration of burst against the period of the um, of the oscillations. You get these staircases where it seems the burst duration is kind of jump from being some constant value and then jump up and being some other constant value. Do you know what the effect in that is? Yeah, we've, we've noticed that. And we've tried with a smoother uh, ramp to see if it was the, our injection or not. And it seems like it is uh, due to the synapse they have between them. Because when, when, adapt, when injecting current in the N1M, uh, the effect is as a, a longer uh, depolarization. So the N3 can adapt their, the, its bars. So it seems like the, the synapses uh, it, that is defined in this model um, has this uh, this effect uh, of changing the like the the capacity. Okay, and then the jump happens from that is when there's an extra spike in the first. So, sorry, I cannot hear you properly. Then the when the actual jump happens in between these kind of flat periods, that's when you have an extra spike in the burst, I suppose. So an extra, sorry? spike in the burst. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Uh, it seems, yeah, it seems like it is because of the, the duration in the third one. Thank you. That's, okay, thank you. <laughs> Alicia, I have one question I'll, I'll ask in case in case I'm allowed. So your models actually give you an opportunity to kind of determine which of those ionic currents control the invariance. Do you have any, and, and I, I would bet that would be a great next step, but, but do you have any uh, insight into which, which of those currents might be responsible for the invariance? Uh, I don't know if I understand your question, like uh, the current. You have, you know, for the I, the acetylcholine current, the T current, the yes. sodium L current. Ah, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. 
So which one? I think uh, we think it's it's a combination of all of them, as well as the the synaptic input, uh, like the synapse and the the type of connection they have between them. Mm -hmm. uh, since, um, for example, when in the third neuron, this post inhibitory rebound it had, uh, it's the one that allows like it stops uh, and he invites. Uh, the N1 and it sends to this slow spike in it has at the end that it can adapt the N1, but that wouldn't be possible if the connection between them uh, wasn't that uh, the one it is. So it's a combination of all of them. It's not that just one specific channel is the, uh, the one generating everything. Of course. Seems like a ripe opportunity there yeah. you've got. All right, thank you, Alicia. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone for um, for um, attending our last session. Um, as a reminder, there, this is your opportunity to take a bio break uh, at this point, to grab some food, whatever it is you need in your time zone. Um, and we will be back at um, in about 15 minutes, whatever time zone it is, wherever you are. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.